Welcome to She Ventures. I'm Doria, co-founder of Sensei. Listen to women who take risks, build community, and get shit done. Recording from Madison Avenue in New York City. Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com forward slash she ventures and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audibletrial.com forward slash she ventures to get started today. Today, I'm honored to speak to a woman who is on the front lines of fighting financial illiteracy. Let's look at some stark statistics. Only 17 states require high school students to take a personal finance course, and only 20 states require a course in economics. At the same time, we have a situation where Americans are graduating with staggering college debt. Student loan debt, as we all know, has reached $1.6 trillion, and people are facing more pressure to manage their retirement, not to mention all the financial choices that come in between. Yet many find that they don't have the skills that they need to do so. After a brief stint in the business world, this high school personal finance educator has spent 20 years teaching high schoolers in Hopedale, Massachusetts, innovative and meaningful ways to understand personal finance and make a difference in their futures. One of her favorite quotes, which you will find everywhere that you see her, is, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. Talitha Oliveri, welcome to She Ventures. Thank you so much for having me. It is really true, I think, that experiential learning is critical when it comes to any kind of learning. When you were growing up, what would you say, just so we learn a little bit about you, was the biggest influence on you? I think the biggest influence growing up was the fact that I grew up in a very small town in mm -hmm. Oregon. Actually, I moved entirely across the country after I, no way. I did. Yeah. Me too. No way. Yeah, I'm, I'm from Portland. Oh my goodness. I, I grew up in Philomath, which is a very small town outside of Corvallis, where Oregon State University okay. is. Okay. That's funny. Yep. So I grew up in this small logging community, and it was in the early 80s, and uh, times were tough. I remember my father worked at a lumber mill, and he was in and out of work during the housing crash of the 80s. You don't need lumber when they're not building houses. And so times were really tough. And I knew early on that my parents were not going to be able to help me financially to pay for college. And I share this with my students. Part of one of the things that I like to do in class is share stories, because if they can hear it from me, someone that I hope that they respect, then they can realize that people go through tough times and they make it through them. When I was in high school, I knew that I needed to work hard so that I could help pay for my own college education. And so those early on experiences, and I share with my students, I remember a time when I was in seventh or eighth grade having outfits that I could count on one hand. And when you're a very impressionable young student in middle school, that really has an impact on you. Of course. So that got me started wanting to be able to improve my future. It makes a lot of sense, and it really resonates with me, the idea of storytelling. One of the things that I do in addition to the podcast is I am the co-founder of a website called Sensei, and we try to teach finance or personal finance through storytelling because we've also found that it's through the story and the fact that this is happening to real people and their real problems that it, it really resonates uh, and I think makes it much more easy to understand than, say, a textbook or a, a formula. No, I agree. It makes it relatable and relevant to um, the yes. audience that's in front of you. Absolutely. And so many of the women that I've had on my show have pivoted in their careers. And it sounds like very early on, you had a pivot. You were in the business world for a short time and then decided to become a teacher. 
Can you talk to me a little bit about that pivot and why that happened? Sure, of course. When I was in high school, you know, they ask you the question, what do you want to do when you grow up? Oh, I want to be a lawyer or, um, you know, in the back of my mind, I thought teacher, but I'd had the notion that I wanted to do something that made money. So I said business. And I was involved in an organization in high school called DECA, which is a marketing organization for uh, emerging leaders in management, hospitality, finance, and marketing. I followed that path initially, which led me to Johnson Wales University in Providence, Rhode Island. I went out into the field after I graduated from college, and I just wasn't getting that sense of fulfillment that I wanted. I was doing a great job and, um, you know, working up in the ranks of management, but there was something that was missing. And I realized that I wanted to go back to school and go into education and be a teacher. So that sense of fulfillment was really what you were looking for and you found. Yes, absolutely. That work-life balance was not equitable before I became a teacher. It was the best choice that I ever made. I have to say, looking back now, I'm close to 50. I I think that I underestimated the importance of work-life balance, but I commend you for having seen that early on and found a profession that supported that. You started as a math teacher and you taught the basics, meaning algebra, geometry, and pre-calc. And you also taught a course called financial algebra, which was meant for students who weren't planning on attending a four-year college to kind of learn the basics. And one of the things that you said about that is that the math was the easy part, but you found a dearth of material on practical topics like things like student loans or 401ks, you took matters into your own hands. And I wondered if you could talk to our listeners about what you did. What was the process? What did you see and how did you tackle it? What I saw was, as you mentioned, I could teach the math. I could give them an exponential equation and have them figure out how the compound interest worked for a student loan, but I couldn't explain to them how to, what the difference was between a federal student loan and a private student loan and all of the topics and terminology really that goes along with student loans or any other financial topic. Um, And I felt that that was really something that was missing and something that was really useful and important and relevant to their daily lives. So I I became passionate about it, knowing how I had experienced the lack of finances to support, you know, my family growing up. I wanted to make sure that I could educate students so that they could make the right money management decisions as they moved forward. So I started by going to conferences. I went to a training back in 2011 was the first one. It's called Take Charge of Your Finances. Uh, It's through the University of Arizona. They had a a program that they worked with. They're doing some great stuff in Arizona, from what I understand. Yes, and the information just started, was a launching point for everything else for me. You know, I just continued to go to different conferences and subscribe to different websites. And a lot of it was self-learning, finding something that Mm -hmm. was interesting to me or as a topic came up that I was trying to teach and I didn't know enough about, I dug into it to make sure that I could explain it to the students. What would you say is unique about your teaching style or method as far as financial literacy goes? I think that... Every day is different. Mm -hmm. They're not going to come in and know that, okay, we're going to start with a warm up and now take out your textbooks or, you know, take this test, etc. I try to involve the students as much as I can. Um, I always apologize to them when I have to, quote unquote, lecture and share information Mm -hmm. with them because I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be about them. So I try to do interactive activities with them or investigations, really, so that they're digging into an interactive that will show them the difference between how much 
they need for their retirement and how much they would have for the retirement given a certain set of parameters. Got it. Do you ever have students come up with ideas that they themselves want to investigate? I actually, this year I gave just, I have a quarter long class is how it works Mm -hmm. at my school. And I said to them, we have two weeks left. What do you want to learn? (laughs) What have we not covered? (laughs) There were a variety of things, but the main one that came up was investments, which was what I, it was what I was planning on covering next. So it worked out perfectly. Uh, But they do, they ask questions all of the time. Um, We do have a a neat program here at Hopedale that we started, gosh, 2014, no, 2015, 16, I think. We have a financial literacy fair that some places call them credit for life fairs, where we organize local businesses to come in for a morning, set up, ours is in our gymnasium, and there are different stations such as rent, the housing booth, there is the clothing booth, and the bank, and auto loans, car insurance, all of those, and students are given a budget and a, a job that they've pre-selected prior, and they have to budget for a month and make sure that they end up with uh, money left over at the end of the month, and we give them different goals that they have to meet. I was going to say, you're you're being very modest, because I I think this was something that you received a $5,000 seed grant from in 2015 to pilot from the Massachusetts Financial Education Innovation Fund. You had started it as a financial education fair, as you said, and now every year, it happens. And is it called FinFit for Life? Yes, that is the branding that the students put on it. I also teach uh, marketing classes, so that's always a part of everything. Um, But the FinFit for Life brand, you can go to FinFit for, the number four, life.com, and you can see all of the wonderful work that the students have been doing for the last few years. That's exciting. Yeah, it... uh, It has really grown. It started just with the senior class, and actually it's a student-run event. I'm the advisor, but I have a group of, actually it's my DECA students, I'm the DECA advisor as well. Life comes full circle. I started, uh, I had a, one of my teachers in high school, my business teacher, Mrs. Atherton, uh, had a great influence on my life. Things have come full circle, now I am a DECA advisor. I have a team of three students each year who lead the charge for organizing this event. Um, And we have 30 plus volunteers that come in. The first year it was just the seniors and I think the second year, but we decided that we wanted a little bit more. We wanted to see the growth of students, financial, their comfort with their financial decisions if you start and do it as a junior and then do it again as a senior. What what did you find? We found that they are much more comfortable the second time around because they've done it before. So right. if you can give these students relevant hands-on experiences and they can practice, it makes a huge difference in their ability to manage their finances in the future, I feel. And their confidence. Correct. Yeah. The, uh, we always do a feedback afterwards with the uh, volunteers and the students. Volunteers are there for both groups of students, and they comment on how incredibly more poised and confident and knowledgeable the kids are the second time in the senior round than they are in mm-hmm. the junior round, which I think is really kind of cool to witness. Very cool. I look forward to looking at the site. I haven't yet, and I would love to see the work. That's really cool. And I have heard of other high schools and even colleges doing fairs like this. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them call them credit for life fairs. I just felt like it wasn't really all about credit. So we decided to come up with the financial fitness fair Mm -hmm. and then named it FinFit for Life. Let's delve into the issue of Financial Literacy Month. Well, I think there are a plethora of issues, but one of them is that more than 
one in six students don't meet the baseline of financial literacy proficiency. And we're talking really, really basic stuff. How, as a country, do you think we got here? And how, in your view, as an educator, someone who is seeing this, you know, day in and day out, how do we move forward? Well, I think we got here by not having conversations. And those conversations could be between parents and children. Those conversations could be between parents and schools, between students and schools. And financial literacy needs to start young. And if that's not happening, then they're at a disadvantage before they even start. It's a vicious cycle with lower income communities where that information the parents don't have the information to share and the children go in, don't get the information either. And I feel that as schools, I feel we have a responsibility to educate our students for the 21st century and for their lives. And obviously the American public education system needs to educate our children on all of the different maths and English and history and sciences. But we need to make sure that our children are prepared to make those lifelong decisions once we get out of here. And you mentioned the $1.6 trillion in student loan debt. Uh, it's frightening. So to move forward, it's going to take some grassroots efforts, I think, for people to help share that information and the crisis that it is. There is um, a company, a nonprofit rather, that I've done um, a lot of work with and have contact with called Next Gen Personal Finance. And their founders, Tim Renzetta and Jessica Enlich, they have a grassroots campaign out there to, it's an advocacy campaign. And they have this amazing, crazy goal that right now I can't think of the statistics, which I am, I'm sorry, Tim and Jess, that I can't. <laughs> <laughs> but they have gold standard schools, of which my school is not yet because I don't have a personal finance requirement uh, for graduation. At least we have the personal finance class. But if we're going to move out of the cycle of financial illiteracy, then we need to make sure that every child in every school is having this taught to them in the classroom. Do you think that it's enough to legislate it? I mean, personally, I do, but, but you know, I'm, I'm one small person here. The yeah. trouble with the legislation, and I've worked with people in the state of Massachusetts who are more knowledgeable on this than I am, but there's a lot of bureaucracy when you get into the legislation, but it's funding. In Massachusetts, in January, they did pass a law, or a bill rather, that financial literacy education is going to be included in our curriculum standards, but it's not still not required in the classroom. Okay. So it's a start, but right. if I'm a superintendent and I have to choose between funding mandated state testing and funding financial literacy education, I mean, I think, unfortunately, we know where the decision has to lie, and I don't fault them for that, but they have to do what's what's best for their school systems, and they have to answer to the results of that statewide testing. So, yep, they're in a hard place as they well. They absolutely are. They absolutely are. Understood. As a 20-year educator, where do you see the biggest gaps in student knowledge when it comes to financial literacy? They get a lot of the general, the banking from home. When I have a limited time with students, and at this point in time, I only have them for nine weeks, the majority of them, I don't cover a lot on banking because I feel that that's something that they do have knowledge of. But uh, credit scores, how credit works, they definitely lack knowledge on even some simple things, 401ks, retirement, all of those things, they absolutely are not getting that education elsewhere. Do you get a sense that, I'm not sure exactly how to formulate this question. I guess at the top of the show, I had mentioned that college graduates are coming out and most of them 
are coming out with this kind of debt-driven mindset because of their situation. And I was wondering what steps we can take as a community to help them move forward. The people that are in debt or before they get into debt? How about before? Okay, all right. So, uh, and that's one thing that I, I actually haven't touched upon and is the student loan debt is one of the large pushes that I actually do cover in my class because I explained to them that this is the second largest financial decision that they will make in their lifetime and they're 18 years old. Yes. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people tell me that they signed on the line, on the dotted line for their student loans, but actually had no idea what they were signing. And that's frightening. And what kind of helped me get pushed into this direction was, it was the summer, we had done our financial literacy fair once, the seniors had graduated, and then they came back for the next year's graduations. And I was sitting and talking to them at their graduation, at someone's graduation party, I said, well, what is your student loan debt? Oh, I don't know. And I thought, oh dear, I didn't do a good job, did I? (laughs) So so I made sure that uh, in my class, what we started as, um, I call it, how much do I make? And I have them research a profession that they would, the entry level salary of a profession that they hope to be in when they graduate from college. And then we go through the entire, we find a paycheck calculator. What would it be like taking out the taxes compared to if you put money in a 401k versus not putting in a 401k? So they now have that net pay figure. And then we take that number and figure out how much student, we do a whole assignment on student loan how much they would be taking out in student loans, and what is the percentage of your salary that you would be spending on your student loans. And that has a really big impact. Oh, I bet it does. So, I mean, in the last few years, I have heard and seen a lot of different choices. I hear students making better decisions, and I I, I can't help but think and hope that it's because of the fact that they had that awareness. I would think so because it makes it very real when you're able to see if this is the job I hope to get and it pays X amount a year and this is what I'm going to owe, it really puts it in perspective. Mm -hmm. A couple of weeks ago, there was a conference at the University of Massachusetts, their Amherst campus, and the current commissioner for the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is trying to get teachers and administrators in Massachusetts to kind of think a little bit differently about how we are educating our students. And he had invited people to speak, and I spoke with a uh, fellow financial literacy educator, Jackie Prester, who works at Mansfield High School, um, and ours was on financial literacy K through 12. And part of that, we started with, In kindergarten, first grade, what could you do to promote financial literacy? And then what could you do in the next level of grade levels? And then in grades five and six, we actually have a program here at high school where we have students that are teaching students. And they go up to the elementary, we have a K through six elementary school, and they go up and teach them a lesson on wants versus needs and then saving. Then I talked, part of the presentation talked about what we do at the high school level, but the culminating piece of it was I had a former student of mine who is a, he's a sophomore at UMass Amherst come and be part of the presentation as a testimonial as to how financial, the financial literacy education that he got had impacted him. What did he say? He said, exactly what we're talking about. He, it was a question from the audience and um, he said it made me think twice about the school um, that I wanted to go to because I didn't want to be in all of that debt. You know, that was, uh, it was confirming. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> of, of, of what we've been doing. That's really wonderful to hear. Another topic that I think is part of this puzzle that you've 
alluded to, or maybe even spoken about directly, are teachers. And one of the statistics that I found is that fewer than 20% of teachers report feeling competent to teach personal finance topics. With that in mind, what can they do or what can their administration do to get them cost-effective or innovative training to boost their confidence with these topics? I agree wholeheartedly that originally I didn't feel confident, and which was why I took the initiative to go out and get educated, but not everyone has the same drive. There are organizations. We have uh, Massachusetts Jumpstart. There's a national Jumpstart organization that has conferences, annual conferences on financial literacy, and there are multiple scholarships to get teachers there. That also was kind of a jump in my education on financial literacy was going to one of these conferences. There is a company I mentioned, the nonprofit that I mentioned prior, NextGen Personal Finance, who they are working on going around to all 50 states and having free quality financial literacy professional development conferences that uh, administrators and teachers can sign up for in all of the 50 states. And it's free to the schools. It's free to the schools. And the materials as well. That's fantastic. Yeah, no, they, uh, I use a lot of their materials. They are in Google Doc form and it makes it very easy for you to adjust it to your classroom practice. Right. Which is key. Well, one of the things that I also have heard from teachers is, and I heard this a little bit from you, is finding time in the day because teachers have pressure to teach so many core subjects. So for those teachers who feel a calling to help with financial literacy, do you have any suggestions if they really can't get away from the core of what they need to teach? Any suggestions on how they can meld financial literacy into what they teach? That's an interesting question. That's a great question. I mean, how could they meld into their subject matters. One easy way to do that, I think, is almost any subject matter that you teach, you could probably throw a project in on some kind of budgeting. Even if it's, I know there's an English teacher in our classroom who, I'm sorry, in our school, it's a culminating project, and I cannot remember which book that they've read, but they have to plan a trip to, I think it's New York City, Um, And they have to come up with the hotel costs and the transportation costs and all of those things. I mean, that would be one way, I would say. Absolutely. You remind me also that in day-to-day life, there are so many opportunities. Even going grocery shopping with your six-year-old could be a way of looking at prices and deciding what makes the most sense. It's a smaller example. but And, and that's another, uh, that's actually a great point, is getting the parent-student-slash-teacher connection going. Even if you don't have time in your classroom, you could still, for example, I had students ask their parents, what's the biggest financial regret that you have? And just to start that conversation with the parents, between the student and the parent, that is the hardest thing to do. Some families are very open about their finances, but other families, you know, it's pretty closed. It's very hard for students to find out if their parents can or can't help with their college education. So as teachers, even if we don't have much time, if we just, you know, periodically throw a question out, you know, here's your homework tonight. Talk to your parents about X, Y, and Z, and we'll have a quick discussion about it tomorrow. There's no work that's involved on the teacher's part, but at least it's the conversation that has started. That's a fantastic idea. I love that. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Talk to me about some of your, I guess I'd call them big wins or small wins or aha moments. When When you have that moment where you're teaching someone and you realize that concept that you wanted to get across is really resonating with them. I know the student at Amherst is one example. Do you have others? I have lots. (laughs) I mean, that's that's why I do this. 
Even today, a student, yesterday I introduced this game, it's called Stax, S-T-A-X, that mimics 20 years of investing in 20 minutes. And we had played with it in class yesterday. It starts with savings account, and then it builds on and adds CDs that they can invest in, and then the index fund comes in, and then the stocks come in, and then they have bonds, government bonds, crops, and uh, gold. Wow. Yeah, it, it's a great game. And uh, so we played it as a class, and he came in, he went home and played it on his own. <laughs> and, uh, so he played it multiple <laughs> times. And he said, Mrs. Oliveri, I beat the computer by a million dollars. <laughs> and uh, he goes, but then the other time, uh, I didn't even break $100,000. I mean, the goal, is, the game itself is following index funds to try and show that that is going to be the best, that over time, index funds have had solid positive growth. So that was one, just a quick one. And a couple of years ago, I had a student in my financial algebra class who, you know, he didn't like to come to school much, but he always, he was a hard worker outside of school. He was always very involved in the conversation, always had a lot of great questions when he was in class. He had graduated and one day he stopped by and he had a binder and uh, he said, Ms. Solveri, I just got my first job with this, you know, really good construction company in the area. And he said, can you help me with my 401k? Oh, that is <laughs> wonderful. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> yes. Um, he actually stopped by within the last couple of months to say hello. And uh, I asked him how his 401k was doing. He says doing great. And when I got a pay raise, I put in another percentage. And it's just awesome. I'm telling you, he's probably ahead of all of <laughs> us. Good for him. Yeah, no. <laughs> it was great. That's wonderful. Have you noticed any difference either in how you have to approach or in interest between male and female students with personal finance? Hmm, that's a good question. In most of the topics that I that I cover, I haven't seen, with the exception of maybe historically the investing, maybe males were more interested than females. Other than that, I think it's pretty equal. Okay. And equal interest? And equal interest. Yeah. I mean, they've been around enough in the in this particular school system because they've heard the buzz of the financial literacy fair and we're always promoting facts and whatnot. So I think that there's a general interest by by both. That's fantastic. Talk to me about DECA. You've mentioned it at the beginning of your life. You are involved in it now. How can either a parent, student, or teacher who doesn't know what it is get involved? It would need to be through, you would need a business teacher that okay. um, was interested in being an advisor for a club. Students do need to be enrolled, have been enrolled in at least one business class. And it is part of, you know, there are 200, over 250,000 students nationwide. We use Google Hangouts for communication with the students. So for... Students to get involved, if their school doesn't have one, then they would, you know, need to find an advisor who was interested in starting the organization. It's really a great academic club, I would say. You can compete in a variety of ways. There are written projects that you can do that have an oral presentation component. There are role plays and testing options. What is the mission of DECA? The mission is to prepare students for life as emerging leaders in society afterwards. They use the business management, finance, marketing, and hospitality, but not all of my students are going into those fields. Um, they're learning interviewing skills. They're learning how to research a career that is interesting to them because they have to choose a an area that they're going to focus on. The students who have done projects, they do 20-page papers that are on par with anything I think that you're going to see at the college level. So they are prepared ahead of actually getting to college on what is 
required uh, to be successful with those types of projects. That's wonderful also because it's such a confidence booster when you feel that you've done the legwork to have your bearings in what's a a really tough time when you're trying to figure out what you want to do. I have, uh, there is a financial literacy promotion plan is one of the areas for DECA, um, which kind of coincided when we started this four plus years ago. And the first year, the students placed second at the state competition. Nice. And then I had a fourth, a third, and then this year they placed first. And they're heading to the uh, international competition in Florida coming up at the end of the month. Congratulations. Yeah, they did a great job. Wonderful. Going back to something that you alluded to before about parents, you know, there's this cycle that happens where if a parent doesn't necessarily have financial literacy knowledge, him or herself, it's really difficult to be in a position to teach your children. And a recent study found that 72% of parents have some reluctance speaking to kids about money. So for parents who feel that they're struggling themselves, do you have any recommendations of where they may go to learn so that they can then in turn help themselves and also help their children? There are a lot of online sites that can help have, you know, videos that might help them understand those topics a little bit more. I know that I'm not promoting a bank or whatnot. It happens to be my bank, Bank of America has a whole money series, and a lot of the banks do, that are short video clips that you can watch that actually give you advice on how to maybe have this conversation about different money concepts with your children. Um, Okay. And sometimes local communities, I know, will have nights for parents. And unfortunately, parents are just as busy as the students are. And it's sometimes hard to get parents to school events. But uh, If that is an option in your community, then I would definitely encourage parents to take advantage of that or reach out to their schools and say, we're interested in this. What type of information can you provide or how can you help us? So what I'm hearing from you is that it's no longer an issue of there being a a dearth of information. There is information out there and it's a matter of, of actively seeking it out. Correct. Okay. And you had mentioned that people should start teaching their children about money early. Can you give me an example of a lesson that you would think appropriate for a like K through, I don't know, first grader? Uh, and this is just a short little activity that um, we found on Sesame Street website. And, uh, mm-hmm. Okay. It's showing, there's a little video that you could show the children about Elmo. And Elmo has a dollar and, you know, he's walking around Sesame Street and, well, what can Elmo buy with this dollar? You know, and it gives some options of what he could buy and he talks to a few people. And then it's as simple as having, you could pass out, they have little Elmo bucks on the website that you can print out and asking the kids, what would you spend this dollar on? Something as simple as that. Have a little conversation with them in the classroom. Like I would also have a parent, a connection with that. Today we had these conversations in class, somehow continue that conversation at home. Do you think the conversation of a need versus a want is also a good one for that age? I think that that's a very good one. It uh, There was another activity through practical money skills. It's a, an offsite of a uh, a visa that they've created, a lot of little interactive activities for children. Um, And I think it's called Peter Pig. And you're sorting coins based upon needs and wants and how much things cost and whatnot. So simple things like that can also be, you could do that at home or you could do it in a classroom and it doesn't take any extra preparation time on a teacher or a parent's part because it's not a difficult concept. Yes, true. Although it's amazing how even adults uh, (laughs) struggle with it, whether it's conceptual or not. 
So if you were to be able to ask for one thing, you could, you had your wand and you doesn't have to be practical, just, just one thing that you think would make financial literacy available to all, what would that one thing be? Make it available to all grades K through 12 or just in general? I was thinking in general, but since your expertise is K through 12, that's fine. I think consistency. If if you could have even a lesson or two that built and carried on from grades K to, let's say, six, um, just so that they're consistently seeing something and they know that it's separate from their daily math assignment and their daily science assignment. I know that in the state of Utah, they do an excellent job there. And they have, I think it's at the high school level, a passport, they call it. Um, So if you had something like a financial passport of things that they had to learn, grades K through six or K through eight, but I think that that consistency, and then at the high school level, I honestly believe that financial literacy should be a graduation requirement, at least a semester-long class. But if you absolutely if you paired those things together, I think it could really make a difference. So fi- something like a financial passport, which I love that idea, paired with graduation requirement, mm-hmm. at least a sem- semester long or half a semester. I can't remember which you said. The longer, the better, probably. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> would I think would go a long way. If people want to learn more about the programs that you're overseeing at Hopedale, where can they look? One place they can look is the the finfitforlife.com uh, website. It shows from a student's point of view um, what we've done. They can, I do have a, a Twitter at T underscore Oliveri that I try and send out financial literacy tweets on. You mentioned teachers having time in the day, so I'm not as good as I could be, but it gives an idea and a a glimpse into my classroom. And I have a website that um, some of that information is on also. It's kind of in a, it's in a rebuilding stage at this point. (laughs) Okay, so we're not going to mention that yeah. today, I guess. Uh, and you can <laughs> check my uh, some of that information. I have links on my LinkedIn account, too. Wonderful. And can you, you had mentioned Next Gen Personal Finance, uh, National Jumpstart, the activities that you're doing at Hopedale. Is there anything else, any other free resources for listeners that you wanted to mention before we end? I know that Practical Money Skills has has quite a few free resources. Jumpstart is actually, they have a clearinghouse. So Jumpstart Clearinghouse has a wealth of free resources, paid for resources that you can search through to find information that's going to be exactly what you're looking for, for your school or for your district. So it's from different publishers, say? Correct, correct. Got it. And you're able to search by topic. Yes. Talitha, I want to thank you so much, firstly, for what you're doing for our students. And I am very grateful to have you on for Financial Literacy Month. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to um, be speaking with you today. And I really just want to get the message out that we can make a difference. It takes one person, but then that can grow. And I honestly, honestly believe that if we can educate these students on the importance of financial literacy in their lives, that it will, it'll change their lives, but ultimately it could change the economy if they understand the ramifications of all of those different decisions that they're making. You've been listening to She Ventures. Like what you heard? You can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to subscribe and sign up for our newsletter so you never miss a show.